Welcome to this Medicine Masterclass on Medical Ethics and Law, in which we will be discussing the contentious topic of euthanasia. We will explain the definition, physician-assisted suicide and family-assisted suicide, end-of-life care, and some important relevant cases such as the Diane Pretty case and the Debbie Purdy case, and some of the key ethical considerations and the more contemporary Lord Faulkner Bill on assisted dying. Euthanasia translates as a good death, and this is the painless killing of a patient suffering from an incurable and painful disease or in an irreversible coma. To date, this is illegal in the United Kingdom under the Suicide Act 1961. Two forms of euthanasia, physician-assisted suicide, where the physician is involved in measures intentionally designed to terminate a patient's life, and this constitutes murder in the United Kingdom. Family-assisted suicide is when the family take the patient to a clinic where the patient can be euthanized, and this also constitutes murder in the UK, but there are some exceptional circumstances. Contrast this to end-of-life care. This refers to the total care of a person with an advanced incurable illness and does not equate with dying. The end of life care phase may last for weeks, months or years. And is defined as care that helps those with advanced progressive incurable illness to live as well as possible until they die. It includes the prevention and relief of suffering through the assessment and treatment of pain and other problems physical, psychosocial, or spiritual. Let's focus on physician-assisted suicide. This is where physician involvement intentionally is designed to terminate a patient's life. This might include knowingly and intentionally providing the patient with the knowledge or the means to end his or her life. This includes providing in information about lethal dosages of drugs, prescribing lethal drugs, or supplying them. Administration of the drug may be by the individual, him or herself, during the process of physician-assisted suicide. Active euthanasia is drug administration. Consider the case of Lillian versus Cox in 1992. Dr. Cox, regarded as an, as an inspirational, caring and dedicated hospital consultant of a distinguished reputation. Mrs. Boys, his patient, of 13 years presented with disabling rheumatoid arthritis was terminally ill. She had agonizing pain, not responsive to any of the analgesics being administered. She wanted to die. She recorded this decision in the notes and her two sons constantly by the bedside, urging Dr. Cox to help end their mother's life and suffering. Dr. Cox eventually acquiesced and administered a lethal dose of potassium chloride, and she died a few moments later. This was escalated, and a crime of attempted murder of an elderly patient who was suffering was brought against Dr. Cox. Sidney Kentridge, a QC leading the defence, said Dr. Cox's actions had been unorthodox and controversial, but his main intention had been to relieve Mrs. Boyce's sufferings. Neil Butterfield, the QC leading the Crown Council, said that while it was the doctor's duty to minimise suffering, it was unacceptable to the law and the medical profession to kill a patient to end that suffering. In the end, Dr Cox was guilty of manslaughter, not murder, as it couldn't be determined if the potassium chloride caused the death or it was the background conditions that caused the death, and he was given a suspended sentence but not struck off the General Medical Council and continued to practice medicine. When the physician provides medication or leaves medication in the hands of the patient to facilitate death, this is physician-assisted suicide. In law, euthanasia has no special legal position in the UK and instances of euthanasia are treated as murder or manslaughter. The Suicide Act of 1961 makes a specific offence of criminal liability for complicity in another person's suicide while declaring suicide itself to be illegal. So let's look at the issues against physician-assisted suicide. Permitting assisted dying for someone could put a vulnerable person at the risk of harm. 
Such a change would be contrary to the ethics of clinical practice, as the principal purpose of medicine is to improve patients' lives, not to shorten it. Legalising assisted dying could weaken society's prohibition on killing and undermine the safeguards against voluntary euthanasia. For most patients, effective and high-quality palliative care can effectively alleviate the distressing symptoms associated with the dying process. Compassionate and ethical care for dying should further be developed rather than pushing for physician-assisted suicide. And there's a large source of investment into a, into a comprehensive range of high-quality palliative care services that are available to ensure patients die with dignity. Moreover, professional bodies in the UK whose members are affected by euthanasia oppose assisted dying, including the BMA, the ICGP, the Geriatric Association, the Association for Palliative Medicine and the World Medical Association. However, in 2019, the Royal College of Physicians moved from, the, from opposing assisted dying to a position of neutrality and there have been strong concerns and reservations about this. Dr. Amy Prophet, the Executive Secretary for the Association of Palliative Medicine, argued the case for opposing uh, medical involvement. She said there are political consequences. The shift may be misinterpreted by society and the media and that, that physicians are supposed to support and help patients and prevent death and that the clinical responsibility and the duties of doctors are to avoid harm, to maintain the trust of all of our patients, even when rendered vulnerable by the illness, to protect our relationship with them and that the public would expect this of us. Moreover, wanting assistance to suicide or dying may be triggered by something clinical, but data shows that the majority of reasons people seek assisted suicide are social rather than medical. Autonomy is another key thing to think about. It's not simply an isolated expression of control. The impact of one action to end their life affects friends, family, carers and society. Some people feel that they may be a burden on the health service and this may drive them towards physician-assisted suicide and this may affect their psychological status. There's a safety issue. Safeguards from supporters of physician-assisted suicide cannot clearly be defined in law. There are some arguments for physician-assisted suicide. Professor Tallis is an emeritus professor of geriatric medicine at the University of Manchester and he argues in favour. He says there's a small but significant number of dying people who experience unbearable suffering that cannot be relieved even by the best palliative care who want the choice of an assisted death. A much larger group may not take this choice, but would have the peace of mind if they knew the option was there. And he argues that there's a moral and clinical duty to, expect, to uh, respect all the wishes of our patients. Moreover, circa every eight days, somebody travels from the UK for an assisted death in Switzerland. This option is available, but is costly between 10 to 1,000 pounds. And this country has an estimated 300 suicides every year involving people with a terminal illness. Doctors already provide estimates of poor prognosis and patients may, have a, may not have the capacity to deal with this decision. Under assisted dying law, two doctors and a high court judge would need to confirm that safeguards have been met to provide a safety net. Palliative care and assisted dying are not mutually exclusive and there may be areas of overlap. Family assisted suicide is where a family member assists the patient either to travel to a country where euthanasia can be carried out. This is also illegal in the UK, but there are some specific circumstances. In 2002, Diane Pretty, a patient with end-stage motor neuron disease, sought assisted dying and was prepared to be taken to Switzerland to be euthanized. She wanted to control the time and manner of her death and because of her condition, she could not travel herself and needed the help of her husband. She asked the government to guarantee that her husband would not be prosecuted if he helped her to die. Diane Pretty took the case to the European Court of Human Rights and she argued that the right to life included the right to choose whether she should carry on living under her current condition 
which was against Article 2 and 8 of the Human Rights Act, um, but the court disagreed and said that the right to life was not determined by quality of life and so could not be interpreted as also giving a right to die. She died shortly afterwards. Since the Human Rights Act in 1998, campaigners have claimed that a denial of the right to release oneself from unbearable pain amounts to inhuman and degrading treatment, and this is a violation of Article 8. Debbie Purdy's case is another case that has changed the way that family-assisted suicide was viewed in the UK. Debbie Purdy had multiple sclerosis, and shortly after her diagnosis in 1995, she started to think about how she could think about her death. Debbie took the case to court and argued that it was against her human rights not to know if her husband would be prosecuted if he went abroad with her to help her die. In 2009, Debbie won her case in the House of Lords and the judges said that the law was not clear enough about when people would be prosecuted for encouraging or assisting suicide. They ordered the DPP, the Director of Public Prosecutions, to produce guidance on what makes prosecution more or less likely. The Director of Public Prosecutions issued guidance for family assisted suicide and said that if a person has terminal, uh, is, is terminal with a poor prognosis and there are no conflicts of interest and no financial gain for the party involved and the party involved has done everything to try to convince them of not opting for family assisted suicide then there can be a grudging acquiescence and a healthcare professional cannot assist in any way. <clears throat> Euthanasia, think about autonomy, should a patient, person who has capacity be able to make this decision? Non-malfeasance, do no harm, killing a person is considered the exact opposite of this. Beneficent, to do a good thing, could you argue that you're ending suffering? And justice, think about the resources that are required to go, in, to go into this. There have been developments in the UK. In 2014, Lord Faulkner produced an assisted dying bill in the House of Lords, but it was overwhelmingly rejected by Parliament. In 2005, on the basis of the Faulkner bill, Rob Maris MP introduced the Maris Assisted Dying Bill, which was also rejected at the second reading. But now, it seems the tide is changing with the Royal College of Physicians shifting its position from opposing dying, assisted dying, to neutrality. This is a very contentious issue and divides clinicians. So in this lecture, we covered the definition of euthanasia, distinguished physician-assisted suicide from family-assisted suicide, talked about end-of-life care and palliation, and mentioned Diane Pretty's case and Debbie Purdy's case, one on motor neuron disease and multiple sclerosis, the ethical considerations, and talked about some of the contemporary bills. Thank you for attending this Medicine Masterclass.